Oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you and I praise you, Father, that um, you called this crackpot <laughs> to teach these women this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would use me, that you would speak through me as you see fit, that anything that's of me would fall away, and that only you would shine forth. Amen. So I was thinking this morning as I was praying for you when I came in, or before I came in, I was thinking, y'all get a double blessing for coming out in this rain today. Seriously. Um, So this morning, my time with you is going to cover four things. We're going to do a wrap up. We're going to look back at what we've learned in Genesis. I'm going to give you a forecast of the next study. I'm going to give you an infomercial wrapped up in a favor. And I'm going to give you three challenges uh, as well this morning. And Jackie told me I have 30 minutes to accomplish all that. So your job is to start praying. (laughs) So uh, a couple months ago in the summertime, Jackie asked me if I would be willing to close out the study. So she kind of eased me into this, actually. And I said, okay, well, um, I'll pray about it. And what would you like for me to cover? And she said, you can talk about anything you want. I thought, hmm, does she really know what she's saying? So there are a lot of things I like to talk about. I can totally geek out on cooking and organizing and working in my yard, um, anything to do with plants. And so I thought, you know, what's the best thing I can talk about? Well, of course, it's God, and it's His Word. And the things that He's taught me, and I'm sure the things that He's taught you as you've gone through this study. Um, Okay, I lost my place. The eternal things. So after stepping out of a role that I had been in for many years, God was calling me to a time of rest, and I I have been doing that, but he's never called me to rest from the study of his word. I've studied the book of Genesis um, probably two or three times, but I can tell you that I absolutely loved this study. I loved it for a number of reasons. One, I got to meet some really precious women, and we're in the nose, the, not the nosebleed, the balcony section, and I've gotten to know and love them and seen just their love of God's Word, and they're sitting up there in the corner, I know, cheering me on, and they brought something shameful to our group, those little mini Chick-fil-A chicken biscuits. I've never had one before, so I have a new food addiction, and I have them to thank for that. So as I studied Genesis, though, I was reminded that every time I open God's Word, He has something new for me, because His Word is alive and it's active, and it is fresh every time I open it. And speaking of Genesis, we have just finished studying the foundation of the Bible. And I'm so excited for some of you who have maybe opened God's Word for the very first time. Uh, You have a great foundation to study the rest of the Bible. And then this is the true story we know of God's promises to His people. And these promises, though, ladies, carry us along because they're promises that are made to us as well. The main thrust of Genesis can be pretty much summed up in one verse. And that would be Genesis 17, 7. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after. Who are those descendants? They're us. Those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the beginning of your study, Jen talked about her purpose for writing this study. Do you remember what it was? She said it was to discover more about who God is. She said that in learning about God, we will experience self-discovery. However, she made it a point to say that self-discovery was not the ultimate point, but it's God discovery. She wanted us to know more about who God is. She went on to emphasize that there can be no true knowledge of self apart from the knowledge of God. And that was my prayer for you. I hope that most of you experience self-discovery as a byproduct of getting to know God better through the study of His Word. 
She also asked you to record an attribute of God at the end of each session. She did that in keeping with the purpose of the study. She wanted us to focus on who God is and his character. She wanted us to be good students of God's truth so that our lives and our hearts are being transformed. Just like so many um, of those recorded on the pages of Scripture, in the pages of Scripture, we are on that journey of transformation as well. And our plumb line, ladies, is the Word of God. It's His character that we're after, and we cannot be transformed into His likeness apart from knowing His Word. And that's true, don't you find, in any relationship? So, as Ashley mentioned, my husband and I have been married for 35 years, and I know his character because I know him. I can often finish his sentences. I can tell you how he'll, he'll respond in a lot of different circumstances. I know what he likes to eat. I know what time he gets up. I know what he's likely to wear, which will be a fishing shirt unless I say something. But I didn't know those things about him at first. I had to become a student of who he is. But, I, but in the I don't know Jen talked about in the book, that's the very first important step that we take in the study of God's word. We become students of who and what is important to us in our lives. How important has it been for you this semester to set aside time to get to know God? To put away the lesser temporal things of this world and focus your attention and your time on the eternal God. I hope you did that. Now, I know that we're all in different places in our journey, in our spiritual journey as well as we are in our lives. And like me, though, I hope you saw another layer of who God is, and I hope that you're eager as you studied to get to know more about who He is. Now, I had Jackie poll you guys and ask you to send in an attribute of God that y'all talked about at your table. And here are some of the attributes. That God is faithful. That God is transcendent. That He is omnipresent. That He is loving. That He is transformational that he's a deliverer, that he is patient, that he is merciful, that he is an omnipotent provider, that he is jealous, that he is sovereign, that he is wrathful, that he is long-suffering, he is a promise keeper, he is a pain taker, a way maker, and a chain breaker. Can I get an amen? But Ashley said the two attributes of God that came through the most were probably faithful and sovereign, and the reason I wanted to know and get feedback from you is so that we would all see how God speaks to us individually. And I can bet that behind every attribute of God, there's a story. Like me, the attribute that spoke to you probably has a lot to do with where you are in your spiritual journey and where you are in your life. For me, the attribute of God that rose to the top these last 10 weeks was His sovereignty. No matter what happens, good or bad, God is sovereign over every situation in my life. His plans are never thwarted. And I can tell you that these past 12 months in my life have been particularly hard for a number of reasons, and I may be able to weave some of those in in Nehemiah. But I would, I would also probably say it's one of the hardest of my 57 years. And yet, I can see the sovereign hand of God in every single trial. So I have many reasons to praise Him and thank Him. So let me take a few minutes and let's look back at some of the lessons that we learned in Genesis in chapters 12 through 50. So as we studied together, we saw the blessings of obedience again and again, and we also saw the consequences of sin and how it affects not only the sinner, but the generations that followed. And ladies, that should cause us to evaluate our choices in the here and now and how they are going to affect our children and our grandchildren and our overall Christian witness. You know what I learned? I learned that I am not a whole lot different than those stiff-necked Isra stiff Israelites of that day. And Jen Wilkin, 
I'll, I'll just call her Jen because you know we're on a first name basis now. She showed us the importance of not getting too comfortable. When we do what happens, we easily slide into the influence of those around us. Think about Lot and his choice to get closer and closer to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's just like sin. It takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you wanted or intended to stay, and you pay a lot more than you intended. Then we had to answer the question, is anything too hard for God? God blessed Abraham and Sarah with the birth of Isaac in spite of their unbelief. And then an almost unbelievable test when God called Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son. He was essentially asking Abraham, who is first place on the throne of your heart? Am I enough? Do you have the faith that I can do what I promised to do? And Abraham, he had to come to terms with the fact that all God's promises did not hinge on Isaac, but on God's ability to fulfill those promises to Abraham. Jen walks us through Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac and then how that pointed us forward to Christ. And then we see another example of Abraham's faith when it came time to bury Sarah. He was more than willing to pay any price for that land uh, from the Hittites in Hebron so that he could bury her. And the reason is, is because he believed that the land of Canaan would one day belong to his people. Sometimes, though, the things of God and the promises that he gives us are not realized in this lifetime. She walked us through some painful examples of what generational sin can look like. Our families are just as dysfunctional as they were then. I was reminded in Ecclesiastes yesterday that there is nothing new under the sun. And we saw how favoritism and deception and sibling rivalry, how that can wreak havoc on a family. We watched how making spouses or children or people in general into idols that can quickly replace our worship and our dependence on God. Over and over, we saw how one sin morphed into another that again predisposed another sin. So what if every time we choose to sin, we stop and we think, how will this affect my children? How will my sin look played out in the lives of my children? And I wish I could say I've never seen that happen in my kids, but I have. So think about that. So the bottom line is that sin has the potential to be contagious. And yet through all that sin and all that disobedience, one principle that we saw is true. The plans and purposes of God are never thwarted because of the sin of man. We cannot derail the ultimate plans of God. Are you ready for some good news? Let's talk about some good news. So when we belong to God, he doesn't let us go. He pursues us one way or the other when we belong to him. And we've got to see that in chapter 32 when Jacob wrestled with God. God promised to bless Jacob, and he did. Jacob, from a material point of view, was a very wealthy, blessed man. But you know what? His soul was poor. He spent most of his life wrestling with people, with Esau and Isaac and Laban and even his wives. So God, in his mercy, he came to Jacob as a wrestler. In Proverbs 18, 26, it says, With the pure you will show yourself pure, and with the devious you will show yourself shrewd. During the night of wrestling with God, Jacob discovered that he'd spent his life fighting with God and resisting his will, and that the only way of victory was through surrender. A.W. Tozier says, The Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. God conquered Jacob by wrestling with him and weakening him. That lesson is a lesson that I have learned in my life many times. God's power is made perfect in my weakness. I also remember Jen is saying, and it really stuck in my mind, God breaks us 
to bless us. Do you remember that? And then what does God do? He renames Israel because now, he renames Jacob to Israel because now he has a new identity. And I have a sweet friend in this room that when she received Christ, she began to go by a different name. And I didn't realize that when I accepted Christ at the age of 19, I also started to go by the name Kirsten instead of my family nickname that I grew up with. But when she told me her story is when it dawned on me that that was my story too, even though at the time I didn't realize it. And I love those God winks when I can look back and see the hand of God in my life. And I would be remiss, ladies, if I thought that every woman in this room has been saved from the penalty of their sin struggle. The penalty of sin we know is death. And the simple question is, have you confessed that sin to God and asked for forgiveness through the blood of Christ? My point is this, give it up. If you're still wrestling to surrender your life to Christ, don't wait. Confess your life and receive the peace and the joy in the eternal salvation that comes for your, just for the asking. God will answer all those tough questions you have. You look in his word and you don't understand this and you don't understand that. As you journey with the Lord through the study of his word, he is faithful and he'll answer those questions. Now, Jacob got a new name. But we saw that he wrestled with God over a lifetime because of his sin. And I don't know about you, but we, I can feel like that too. Can you? I have mine and you probably have your sins that you rest, seem to wrestle with the same ones all the time. And a good friend of mine, she calls those her recycled sins. She said, wash, rinse, and repeat all the time. But the fact that you're struggling with your sin even if it's the same old sin, that's a good sign. Because when we sin and we feel that weight of sin, we confess it to the Lord, even though we might repeat it. But that means that he's working in your heart and the Holy Spirit is working to sanctify you. And that's what we call that journey of sanctification. He's working those sins out. Now, throughout Genesis, we saw how Jen showed us the different archetypes of Christ. And didn't y'all love the way she drew those out? Ooh, I did. I geeked out on those. I loved them. So were you just blown away, though, when she drew out the archetype of Christ in Leah? Wow, I thought that was amazing. And then how she um, did the same with Rebecca and then did the same with Joseph who seemed obvious, you know, that one was a little bit more obvious, but the other ones. So I did wear my Joseph coat of many colors is what my friend calls it. I was going to wear something else, but I thought I need to wear my Joseph coat. And what about Joseph? What a clear example of what Satan meant for evil God used for good. He said to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And I said to myself when I read that verse, booyah, Satan, not today. God asked seemingly impossible things of his people, didn't he? And then in turn, though, he gives them the power to accomplish them for his honor and his glory. Not only for his glory, but so that thousands of years later, we can look back at the very same God and know that power too. And know that the promises they claimed then are some of the same promises that we get to claim today. In your study of Genesis, the curtain was going up on the Old Testament, but as we look forward to next semester in the spring, the curtain will be going down on the Old Testament. So next semester, as Ashley said, um, or Jackie said, we're going to be studying Nehemiah. Now, I just want to tell you, don't freak out if you don't really know who Nehemiah is. Truly, it is a lesser studied book of the Bible. So full disclosure, when I was asked to pray about that after she hooked me into this, she, um, I was like, I don't really, you know, intimately know the book of Nehemiah. I know he's a cupbearer and, you know, I briefly studied. And I had to kind of hunt him up in the Old Testament and everything. But I was willing to pray. And after several months of a lot of praying, I was uh, sufficiently confident that God was calling me to teach it. 
He confirmed that through some faithful friends and prayer warriors, as well as through his word, and I hope I get to weave some of that in to next semester. And maybe that's where you find yourself you're not that familiar with who Nehemiah is, or maybe not really even God's word at all, but you're in a great place because every book of the Bible has something to teach you. We're going to journey together and learn it together, but rest assured, I'm getting very intimately familiar with the book of Nehemiah. And I can tell you too, I'm really excited about teaching it. The more I study it, the more stoked I am. And as I've looked at it from different commentators and different teachers that have taught it, there's some different themes that we can focus on. And we'll look at it in two ways. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they talk about rebuilding. They talk about restoration. They talk about being determined about something. They talk about having a heart that can break over the ruins and the rubble that we see in people's lives or even in our country or in other countries. Um, we talk, it talks about what an incredible leader uh, Nehemiah is. And then he is such a man of prayer. And I love that. So does something in your life that has been torn down need to be rebuilt? Perhaps a relationship that needs mending, forgiveness that might need to take place. Maybe your marriage needs some restoration or with a family member, a friend, or maybe even a coworker. Is God calling you to be determined about something specific that you're struggling to give up or maybe something that you're struggling to do, that you're determined to do? It might be to pay off some debt. It might be to get more serious about your health. Make a resolution in the coming year to spend more time in God's Word. Maybe that's what He's calling you to. Maybe you're experiencing a broken heart over something or someone. Are you in a place of leadership? Could you use some tools to become a better leader? And what's your prayer life looking like these days? Does it need a revival? All of this is in the book of Nehemiah. And my prayer is that the study in the spring will touch every heart and mind just like it does every time you open God's Word because we're all at a different place. I hope that the book of Nehemiah moves you from a place of complacency to action. This book will call us as God's people to live by God's Word. You might be weak and struggling at this point, but God is calling you to live by the light of his word, to learn from him and to trust him. In Nehemiah, we're gonna see joyful obedience. We're gonna see lots of opposition. We're gonna see some frustrating failure, just like the things that we face in our everyday lives. We'll see how a remnant of people that we just studied from Abraham's seed grew into a great kingdom of God, just as God promised but then who seem to lose their greatness. But the most important thing that we'll see is not the greatness of God's people among the nations, but the greatness of God and the one who would come from them to bless the nations. Nehemiah will also point us forward to Christ.